Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of the Holistic Pharmacy Podcast, Journal Club Edition. I am your host, Dr. Jenna Carmichael, and I am here today with Preet Menku, who is a breast cancer coach, and I love chatting with other coaches. And so we're going to be chatting today about prolonged nightly fasting and breast cancer prognosis, which is a journal club article that was linked in the show notes if you're interested. But Preet, please tell our um, audience today a little bit about yourself and how you got into um, cancer, cancer coaching. Yes, sure. So um, as you mentioned, my name is Preet. I am actually, uh, I got into this kind of like a lot of people accidentally or, or unexpectedly. So I have been a pharmacist now for 24 years. Uh, this is year 24 and it actually still blows my mind that I've, I've been doing pharmacy for that long. <laughs> um, but about five or six years ago, uh, I still so as a pharmacist, I kind of I have been in various kind of areas of pharmacy, mostly hospital pharmacy. I did pediatrics for a number of years and uh, a position came up at my hospital for an oncology pharmacist. So I decided that I would uh, take the position uh, primarily because it was a part-time position. And at that time, I wanted something that was part-time. So I ended up, uh, you know, um, becoming an oncology pharmacist with, with the hospital I'm at. And part of my role was to counsel patients on kind of their chemotherapy regimens, what to expect, side effects, how to manage those side effects, uh, and so on and so on. So what I found while I was kind of counseling patients was that I would get a lot of questions. And a lot of it didn't have to actually do with the chemotherapy, but kind of like, what else can I do? Like, you know, does diet play a role? Should I start eating more fruits and vegetables? Should I, you know, well, what will help me with the nausea? What supplements can I take? Uh, is, is ginger something that I can use for the nausea? Should I start taking, should I start using green tea? Like, will this help me, uh, you know, avoid a recurrence? So at the time, I actually didn't know the answer to a lot of those questions. And it brought me to, you know, like, you know, I would tell them kind of like the standard answer, oh, you know, just do what you're doing and go through the chemotherapy and, you know, uh, we'll try to get, you know, treat your cancer that way. But as I got more and more questions, I, I decided to kind of look more and more into uh, the answers to the questions because I, I wanted to know myself. I actually have a couple people in my family. My mother-in-law had ovarian cancer. My grandmother had endometrial cancer and my cousin um, had uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I kind of wanted to know like, was there, was there something else that they could have also done to help with their own cancers? We also have breast cancer in my family. I've got aunts um, with breast cancer and um, from family friends with breast cancer as well. So this was an area of interest to me as well. So I decided to kind of go on this journey of looking for the answers. And so while I was kind of researching the answers, I realized that there's actually so much uh, someone can do to help kind of with, uh, with helping them recover faster from their treatments and mitigating side effects, kind of all of that, that sort of thing. And so this, so what this did was this brought me to a point where I decided I, I needed to know more. So I decided to take a, uh, a cancer like coach uh, program. And so I, I took the program and I, I learned a lot, but I decided I needed to kind of even learn more. So I took a second cancer coaching program. And after I was done the programs, I took all the information that I had learned and put it together into my own kind of program to help women with breast cancer. And so that's kind of where we are right now. And that's kind of how I landed to where I am today. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I resonate so much with that because that is a very similar story to my own. Um, I agree with you. I, I used to work in the oncology space and patients are really smart and they're really inquisitive and they want to know what it is that they can do outside of chemotherapy, outside of traditional treatments, because that's the thing that we know. Those are the things they don't really have a lot of control over. And so they're looking for something to help them give a little bit more control in their lives. And so I, I thank you so much for doing this work because there are so many people out there that are looking for it for sure. Absolutely. Yes. 
So I love talking about intermittent fasting because I think that the data and the evidence out there is really great when we're talking about cancer. And mm -hmm. so this article that you are, we're going to talk about today is called Prolonged Nightly Fasting and Breast Cancer Prognosis. And I think it's a really interesting article because the group that they used as their treatment group, quote unquote, you know, was kind of more out of a different type of study. So I think that that's a really fascinating kind of thing. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this study, um, about kind of how it um, came together and the interesting parts of it? Sure. So uh, the study, as you mentioned, uh, is was called prolonged or it's called prolonged nightly fasting and breast cancer prognosis it was published in jama oncology on uh, in 2016 in august 2016 and so basically it was the first study to kind of um, examine nightly fasting duration and cancer outcomes uh Prior to this, there had been, uh, you know, a number of rodent studies which showed a positive effect of prolonged fasting during sleep on carcinogenesis uh, and, and kind of metabolic processes associated with risk and um, prognosis of breast cancer. Uh, but the objective of this study was to kind of investigate how long uh, you fast overnight, whether that predicted um, recurrence and mortality in women with early stage breast cancer, um, just to determine whether uh, this was associated with risk factors for poor outcomes. And, and these things, like they looked at specifically um, blood sugar regulation. So they, they had a measurement of the hemoglobin A1C, uh, chronic inflammation. So they used a CRP measurement, so the um, C-reactive protein, which kind of in indicates inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, they looked at obesity and then they also looked at sleep. So in terms of like the data that they collected, they uh, collected data from uh, around 2,400 women. So I think the exact number was 2,413 uh, women with breast cancer without diabetes. Um, and the women were aged 27 to 70 years at diagnosis. And they had, as you mentioned, they participated in this of this prospective other study called Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study between uh, March 1995 and May 2007. Uh, the, the data for this study was kind of analyzed in uh, 2015, so kind of like uh, around seven, eight years later. Uh, and they basically were looking at the nightly fasting length, um, and it was basically taken from 24-hour uh, dietary recalls that were collected at baseline for these women at year one and year four. So uh, in terms of the results, they found that um, fasting less than 13 hours per night was associated with a 36% increase in the risk of breast cancer recurrence compared with fasting 13 hours or more per night. So, and that was statistically significant. Um, they also found that uh, nightly fasting less than 13 hours was it was associated um, with a 21 percent uh, decrease or in mortality uh, all cause mortality but that was not statistically significant um, and then each two hour increase in nightly fasting duration kind of was associated with a again statistically significant uh, lower hemoglobin a1c so better blood sugar control and also longer sleep yeah, I just think this data is so fascinating. So we're saying that if you fast greater than 13 hours, then you have less chance of breast cancer recurrence. Correct. Which I think is amazing, right? Because yeah. we're always trying to find something out there that is going to help with, with cancer recurrence. And here's just something really easy. Go to sleep. Don't eat when you first get up and don't eat right before you go to bed. That'll get you your 13 hours. And hey, you're helping with blood sugar control as well, because we're seeing impact on A1C. Uh, what was the impact on the C-reactive protein? Was there any with that? So in this study, they actually didn't find uh, an impact with C-reactive protein. Um, they had found it looking at some other data, and they found it in, in my study, but in this particular study, they didn't actually find that it impacted C-reactive protein. Yeah, because I think too, you know, when I looked at intermittent fasting in general, you know, we hear things that it's great for people who have gut dysfunction because it allows the gut to rest a little bit more. It's really Absolutely. great in cancers. It's great for diabetes. It's great for a whole host of other things. And so I think this is just wonderful to see that there's actual human data first, right? Because a lot of the, a lot of cancer trials, particularly when it comes to these kind of newer 
or different non-drug type trials. They're all kind of like in rats and it's good Mm -hmm. to see that information, but it's better to see it in humans for sure. Absolutely. Like, I mean, obviously it's more relatable to us and, and, you know, this particular study was in women with breast cancer and it was kind of like the first study that looked at uh, an overnight fast in women with breast cancer, looking at specifically kind of recurrence rates. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think the other thing that's interesting to note too, is that because of when the study was actually done, they didn't even know about HER2 status before they actually started the trial. And so they actually made a note in there that was like, well, when we first started the trial, HER2 really wasn't a thing and now it's a thing. And so they can't even control for HER2 status. And so that in of itself is even more interesting to see because we know that patients who have HER2 positivity are gonna have a more aggressive disease, which would then Mm -hmm. make reoccurrence more likely. And Mm so if we're saying that, fasting potentially in patients who could have been HER2 positive helped with reoccurrence as well. That actually is really great data to see. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually, it's really important data for like for the cancer world. And I think it actually um, has implications kind of for other areas as well, such as cardiovascular health, diabetes, uh, not just cancer. So I think it's, it's, it's really important study and really important data to have out there. Yeah, and I agree, because I think the dietary studies can be hard, particularly when we're looking at, you know, a a big group of patients, and unless we're really strictly saying, okay, you can only eat this, this, or this, it's Mm -hmm. difficult for us to really say, because I think a lot of us that work in cancer who are interested in nutrition want some sort of thing to be like, yes, you should eat these things, and no, you really shouldn't eat those things, and we have that sort of information, but that's coming from a variety of different sources. That's not like one big thing. And so I like seeing that here we have all these people that are essentially been told to eat more vegetables. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Essentially, that was kind of the intervention in the trial. And unfortunately, they didn't necessarily find a big dietary in general of eating specific things that would change. But we're seeing that here, this non-dietary strategy, which is kind of a dietary strategy, such as fasting, is something that can be really beneficial. Yeah. And I think um, kind of one of the big outcomes was that it was basically the the glucoregulation, like the hemoglobin A1C lowering that that they found uh, probably made the difference for the decrease in um, recurrence risk for these patients. So that that's really good to know as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So you work with breast cancer patients. Is this um, is fasting a part of the recommendations that you make for your clients? So it is actually a part of my program and it's part of my recommendations. And so the clients I work with, we work towards, um, you know, and they vary like some of them. So I, 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 you know, I start by meeting them kind of where they're at. So uh, some of them have never fasted in their life and some of them are, you know, they're more familiar with intermittent Mm -hmm. fasting and they, you know, they've actually been kind of doing uh, low carb dieting and kind of fasting, uh, you know, during like as soon as they got the diagnosis or sometimes even before having the diagnosis, they just kind of this was just part of their lifestyle from have, reading other information out there. And so so I do. So in my program, like it's actually kind of one of the, um, you know, not the first thing that we introduce, but it's kind of in the top like four or five things that we introduce. And 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 because the study is is like, you know, 36 percent uh, reduction rate like that to me is like so uh, significant. So mm-hmm. because of that, um, we we basically uh, start introducing that relatively early in the program. OK, wonderful. And there are so many different ways to do fasting. You know, I've um, I've looked at the research and particularly when we're talking about cancer patients, you know, I've seen they've done fasting around chemotherapy itself. And they found that by having that around chemo, that chemo seems to work better and that mm-hmm. patients have less side effects when we're doing fasting directly, like two days before chemo, the day of chemo and a few days after either yeah. like severe calorie restriction or just water fasting in general. Um, but then I've also seen other studies where they've done a similar thing, like a five day kind of lowered fasting idea, but it wasn't during chemo. It was maybe sometime else during the cycle, but still found 
good results, patients tolerated it well, um, those sorts of things. And so um, what type of fasting do you recommend? Because this study was every night fasting. Um, and so what types of things do you recommend to your patients? Because there can be a lot of variability. Yeah. So, uh, so with the fasting, like around the chemo, I mean, to me that I, I, I don't consider that to be intermittent fasting because for me, intermittent fasting is basically like um, abstaining from food for a 12 to 24 hour period. So um, the type of fasting that I recommend is, is in my, uh, like the way I look at it is more intermittent fasting. So like we start with, you know, let's do at least a 13 hour fast, overnight fast. So a lot of the times I'll tell my clients, like especially the ones that have never kind of fasted before to stop eating around 8 p.m. and then and then not eat for 13 hours and then they can have breakfast around 9 a.m. And, mm -hmm. you know, depending on uh, the person, like some of them will, you know, they, they prefer to have an earlier breakfast. So like a 7 a.m. breakfast or an 8 a.m. breakfast. And we just kind of uh, adjust the times so that they that we still try to get in that 13 hour fast. Uh, sometimes, you know, some of them are more ambitious. They want to go for 14 or 15. And so we, so we do work that in, but kind of anything over 14 hours, I do, um, ask them to check with their, their oncologist, uh, just to make sure that, uh, the oncologist is aware that, and, and on board with this as well. Um, the other, the fasting that you mentioned with the, around the chemo, like that's more of a kind of a five day um, prolonged, or I guess they would still call that a short-term fast, mm -hmm. but it's not what I would consider to be an intermittent fast. Okay. But yeah, I, I agree with you. The information out there is very positive on the, the five-day fast. And as you mentioned there, the evidence is, is out there that it uh, increases the effectiveness of chemo, of, you know, specific chemo regimens and chemotherapy, and also decreases risk of side effects as well. So that, I mean, uh, that, that's something that, you know, if uh, most of my clients are not on chemotherapy, but that's something that I would consider talking to my clients about if, uh, if I came one, had one that was actually on chemotherapy. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I have a client right now, um, and we're doing the five day fast around chemo, um, and she's doing great with it. Um, and she actually, we were kind of talking about this idea because I think it's a fascinating thought because, so we have our cancer cells and mm -hmm. by through fasting, you know, we're depleting them of that glucose, which most of our normal cells have other ways of finding energy. And so the idea is that we're starving those cancer cells who aren't that resilient. And then we hit them with the chemo. And so it's like more effective in that regard. And so when I tell that to my clients, they're like, oh, well, <laughs> obviously yeah. we're going to do that. If it's, yeah. you know, if I don't have to really do anything and I get a better result and I have less side effects from it, they're all on board for it. hundred percent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we do know that fasting is not for everybody. So what would be the type of person that you would say, I'm not really sure if fasting is for you? So with my clients, like when we look at kind of uh, the intermittent fasting, um, you know, there is, there are a few clients that kind of mention that fasting messes with their hormones. Um, so, uh, you know, fasting can increase your cortisol. And so sometimes they don't sleep so well at night. Um, so can we kind of like uh, work around those things um, for some? So for me, um, as important as fasting when I'm talking to my clients is kind of like uh, introducing uh, a clean eating diet. So when I what I mean by clean eating is, you know, get get, get getting out the processed food. Um, kind of uh, adding in the vegetables, adding in the the the, the good fruits, like the low sugar fruits. Um, for breast cancer specifically, we look at a low fat diet. So, and a low glycemic index diet. So I kind of, you know, as much as I focus on fasting, I, I focus also on the nutrition aspect of what they're actually eating. So to me, like, um, you know, I find like some women tell me when they, when they do intermittent fasting, it causes them to binge. So, you know, or, or other women uh, mentioned that they have kind of serious cravings after fasting. So we, so we kind of have to look at all of that. And so in terms of like who, who I wouldn't recommend it from, obviously, you know, if you're malnourished or that type of thing, um, most of the women I work with are kind of past the chemotherapy stage. So 
it, it, you know, we, we look more at kind of where they are in terms of preventing uh, recurrence risk. So uh, from that perspective, uh, you know, the things that I mentioned are things that I look at and we kind of work around that. And if, and if fasting is something that they can't seem to do or don't want to do, then we'll start with definitely we always start with clean eating. And then we kind of move into um, maybe either introducing fasting later or we uh, will stick to, you know, making sure they eat cleanly. And a lot of times 13 hours is just kind of like, you just kind of do it inherently. It's not a, not a long fast. So it's something that, uh, you know, it's, it, it can be a natural part of, of your diet anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So yeah, definitely. If somebody has already lost a heck of a lot of weight, we definitely mm -hmm. don't want them to go fasting because for the most part, the information that I've seen um, is that, you know, fasting, intermittent fasting tends to be weight neutral, you know, in some people who need to lose the weight and they want to lose the weight, they definitely can. But in other people who don't necessarily need to lose the weight, quote unquote, then it seems to be that there's not a substantial weight loss in those people. And mm -hmm. that is something to be concerned about, particularly when we're talking about cancer patients, we want to make sure that we're not losing too much body mass for sure for those guys. But I think you make another great point about the mental health, right? So if somebody has a history of an eating disorder, yes, or if they have eating or disordered eating tendencies and they find that, you know, the, the intermittent fasting tends to trigger them a little bit, then yeah, definitely. We don't want you to be on intermittent fasting. We don't want to add more stress to, you know, a lot of times our cancer patients have a lot of stress on their plate already. We don't need to add Absolutely. more stress on for that, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with that. And I think you make another good point about the dietary habits too, right? Because there's definitely evidence to suggest that, Intermittent fasting without regard to diet is beneficial, but we do know that intermittent fasting in top of a good clean diet that doesn't have cancer producing, causing foods and other things such as processed foods and added sugars and all the other things that we know can um, influence cancer and definitely then make that, that integration of the intermittent fasting much, 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 much more beneficial. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, I could talk about intermittent fasting all day. I love intermittent fasting. I think that it's really such an interesting tool that we can use um, because I think it's just, it's cheap and it's easy, right? It's free. We're not having to buy anything. Patients don't have to go and get, you know, something else. It's an easy intervention that we can add in and mm -hmm. it has a lot of benefits to it. And so I think that it's definitely something that um, more people should be thinking about outside of the cancer world. You know, I definitely think that in heart disease and in diabetes, like we definitely could see a really good benefit to people if they were utilizing this. And we're not talking about a 16 hour fast, which is generally when you think of intermittent fasting for weight loss is going to be more of that 16 hour fast, but mm -hmm. a 13 hour fast is just go to bed and don't eat as soon as you wake up in the morning. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, like I said, you know, you can, you stop eating by 8 PM and you know, then if you go to bed around 10, that ideally you want to give yourself three hours kind of before uh, of not eating before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. Um, but say you go to bed at 11, um, and, and, you know, you'll get up at seven in the morning, for example, and you just, you just don't eat for the first two hours. Like it's, it's, it's very kind of manageable. It's very doable for most people. Mm -hmm. And for most people, I mean, and, and 12 to 14 hours has been shown to be more like, you know, quite safe and effective as well in terms of like, most people don't, you know, have a, a drop in blood sugar or anything like that uh, with up to a 14 hour fast. It's kind of, uh, you know, you just want to be careful if if someone has diabetes or if they have kind of other, um, they're on medications that are regulating their blood sugar, in which case they might, if they kind of do more than a 14 hour, uh, you know, up to 16 or more hours, they might need to have their medications adjusted. And so they just need someone to keep an eye on their medications in that case. Right. Of course, if you're on any kind of chronic medication, it obviously would be a good idea to discuss this with your doctor because we could definitely see changes in someone's blood pressure, in their blood glucose for the better. 
for yeah. sure, which would be great, which would mean then perhaps they don't need that medication any longer. And so then that's another benefit as well, for sure. Thank you so much pre for chatting with us today about intermittent fasting. Um, and is there any way that if anybody's interested in working with you or if learning more about your program, how they can um, get in touch with you? Yes, absolutely. So um, my website is uh, www.cancerrecoveryroadmap.com. So if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about me, you can go check out my website. Uh, my email address is preet at cancerrecovery.com. So you can uh, email me if you want to get a hold of me. I also uh, have a Facebook group uh, for uh, women with breast cancer. So breast cancer, nutrition, and lifestyle for, uh, prevention and recovery is the name of the Facebook group. So that's another way, like you can, um, join the Facebook group if you have breast cancer or you're just trying to prevent breast cancer as well. Um, yeah, uh, I am on Instagram, although I'm not always active on Instagram. <laughs> And, and then, we'll have all the links in the show notes as well. So if you're trying to feverishly write that down, please know that they're in the show notes. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Preet. It was wonderful chatting with you today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and thank happy you. pharmacist month to you as well. Oh, yes. Is that okay? So that must be in the U.S. It I is. It's a U.S. thing. Okay. Okay. Because I think ours was, well, we had a pharmacist week in March, but okay. I don't know that we have a pharmacist month. <laughs> well, you, since you're close enough in Canada, you can be an honorary pharmacist month for all of oh. October. I'll give it to you. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome.